And please welcome to the podium, Keith Whalo. Let's just make sure my slides are working. And um, if I could see my slides in front of me, that would be terrific as well. Um, otherwise, I'll spend the entire time looking over to my right and my left. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Myra and uh, John and Rich and the Center for this wonderful invitation. Uh, I'm told I have a very limited amount of time to whet your appetite, both literally and uh, figuratively, as you enjoy the appetizers. Uh, I'm here because I'm the author of this book, Pain, A Political History, and so I'll just launch right into it to give you a sense of what the ideological battleground has looked like over the question of people in pain over the last 70 years. I think I may have to crane my neck. Anybody going to help me with that? Nope? All right. So this cartoon really captures some of the tensions surrounding the question of people in pain. And one of the core things I'm trying to do today is to illuminate why it is that treating people in chronic pain has been so controversial in medicine and American society. The doctor hovers over the bedside with the wife next to him, and he says, we can give you enough medication to alleviate the pain, but not enough to make it fun. And the question at the heart of pain medicine for many physicians, and as you'll see for judges as well as politicians, is the question of where is the line between alleviation of pain and the creation of pleasure? Pain really captures a fundamental problem for physicians who are oriented towards the value of objective measurement. Um, the problem of reliable measurement. Pain is necessarily subjective. The expert depends on individual, the patient, uh, secondary indices, blood pressure, respiration, to determine what level of pain a patient is in. It's not really like a true vital sign in the sense of temperature and blood pressure. Uh, it requires a certain amount of intersubjective understanding, if not trust, to believe that somebody is in the pain that they profess themselves to be in. There is a shadow that has always lingered over people in pain, the shadow of doubt, fear, about the consequences of too aggressive pain medicine. A drug dependence is a shadow, the, the shadow of addiction to opioids, opiates, and other medicines, which varies by individuals we know, always compromises and constrains and complicates clinical judgment over how we should relieve people in pain. And as I show in this book, the context matters enormously in understanding how pain has been understood in the clinical realm at the bedside, but also in terms of public policy. End of life pain is a good example. The use of morphine at the end of life for some is seen as crucial to compassionate care, but it suppresses blood pressure, it induces, it, it inhibits respiration, it provides relief, but it also, in the eyes of some, is seen as a means of hastening death. And so where is the line, not just between pain and pleasure, but pain and uh, relief at the end of life? These are become moral concerns, they become political concerns as well. So you might say, in the history of the question of management of pain, cultural values, moral values, about how we should deal with people in pain are always there, laying just beneath the surface of clinical decision making. Cultural values of what, how we should bear pain. Is it best to be stoic? How much level of complaining is, should be given relief? Um, when is pain truly disabling? These are the kinds of issues that have long shadowed people in chronic pain. And my book really looks at how theories of pain and practices of measurement and relief migrate from that bedside that you see in the cartoon, from the realm of science and medicine into the realm of politics and public policy, and also from politics and public policy back into the clinic. And all I can do today is to give you a brief overview of what I try to do in this book. It starts in the era just after World War II, in which 
Physicians weren't even clear that they recognized pain as a legitimate malady, something that was worthy of sustained attention. It looks at this fraught emergence of pain as a leg legitimate medical topic and how surgeons, pharmaceutical companies, and psychiatrists debated what we should do about people in pain. It moves to the 1960s into the 1970s, which is unquestionably the era that saw the birth of pain medicine as a new field, as a legitimate field, but also saw what you might call the liberalization of methods of relief from patient-controlled analgesia um, to the rise of recognizing pain as a legitimate disability that's worth, that, that warrants disability relief. Uh, through this transformation, I track the work of one physician who by the 1970s is regarded as the father of the pain field, John Bonica, uh, who worked out at University of Washington in Seattle, who came back from World War II, and it's really treating veterans after World War II that made him familiar with the racked bodies, the chronic pain that the war had produced, and the need to do something to relieve those soldiers. But then the story of pain in the political narrative takes a turn. And that turn is taken in the 1980s uh, as, you might say, the liberal trends that really characterized the birth of pain as a field in the 60s and 70s runs up against conservative trends. I don't mean conservative trends purely in the political realm. I mean conservative clinical trends as well. I came to the topic of pain as a book because I'd previously written a book on sickle cell disease. And I was struck by the fact that in the 1960s, sickle cell disease emerged in clinical and scientific and also in public policy discussions as a, a disease characterized by recurring pain and suffering among African Americans had too long been ignored. But by the 1980s, you begin to see complaints and concerns by people with sickle cell disease, that when I go into the clinic, I, as one uh, patient said, you have to get past, the, you, have to, um, to, you, you have to convince a doctor that you're in true agony in order to re get relief. That is to say, there was an atmosphere of skepticism that shadows people in chronic pain, regardless of their disorder. And I want to just give you a quick sense of that history and then uh, maybe offer a few observations about the past, not merely as prologue, but the past as something that we're still grappling with today. In the era of the 1950s, you see a kind of attention in physicians and psychiatrists over whether pain is an important topic. You have a Boston psychiatrist, for instance, in 56, who argues that the relief of pain is obviously one of the main functions of the physicians. Ironically, he said, it's one of the things we do least well, partly because we don't understand it. Psychiatrists played a prominent role in thinking about what pain was and how it should be understood. And Henry Albranda, in the California Pain Symposium held in 1957, was clearly a skeptic. He argued that the patient in pain, in chronic pain, was worthy of study, but not necessarily worthy of sympathy. He wrote, complaints of chronic pain may develop in the child brought up to repress feelings of hatred, who then may use those complaints of pain to cover his hostile feelings towards an associate. Pain, in his view, was evidence of maladjustment, of a maladjusted psychology. Malingering, masochistic self-punishment underlies the chronic painful condition. This is a psychiatrist writing, not, he's not an outlier. This is really a dominant way of thinking about what pain is and the inability of individuals to get over their chronic pain. Uh, these issues are still with us today, concerns about malingering as an underpinning to the complainer or the problem of playing sick. Now, why was Henry Albranda so upset in 1956? Well, one of the things that was already at work in the 50s was the creation of new disability benefits. California had passed disability benefits in the 50s, and so too had this gentleman, uh, Republican President Dwight David Eisenhower, Ike, and Ike had been sort of pushed into signing this new feature of Social Security that allowed a disability provision within it. He signed it reluctantly, but this many physicians regarded as the opening of the doors. They saw this as the Trojan horse. And one of the questions that they puzzled over is to what degree not just disability could be measured, after all, physical disability, easy to measure, but what about pain as a disability? 
Increasingly, this question came before the health, edu health education and welfare, health and human services today. How should a patient who claims to be in long-term chronic pain, especially if there are no clear objective or underlying physical symptoms or features of that pain, should be regarded? Should they be regarded as legitimate claimants or illegitimate claimants? One of Eisenhower's appointees, uh, one, of, one of the first claimants to bring a pain case was uh, a Texas housewife named Rosie Page. She had arthritis with a marked psychogenic overlay of her symptoms, and the debate in clinical medicine as well as public policy was, is this truly pain warranting long-term disability relief? Her case was originally rejected by HEW, but it was taken up on appeal by the federal courts. And so the surprising feature of my story is the degree to which the courts, not clinicians and not politicians, were the ultimate arbiters of who is in pain and what level of relief they deserve. At the same time, if you, say there, if you think there's a public sector debate about who deserves relief, there's also a private sector debate unfolding with the emergence of a vibrant and productive drug industry after World War II, and the production of new substances like Percodan. Percodan is back again. Its name is Oxycontin today. It's oxycodone. But even then, as now, there's a debate about whether um, pharmaceutical companies like the Endo Company were inappropriately marketing this drug. In places like California, there was a concern about rising Percodan use. As one physician in the California Medical Association wrote, the drug has acquired the unenviable status of being the principal drug of choice for heroin, substitute for heroin for California-based heroin addicts. And he wrote this, which is a bit of humor, not intended to be humorous at the time. It may seem odd, he said, that California has become the center of Percodan use. Two factors, however, may contribute to this. Percodan, uh, California has an undue share of unstable personalities <laughs> who welcome bizarre methods of escaping reality. But he was also pointing to another, which is actually true in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, but that's another story entirely. It's a social portrait of California at the time, but it was also this context, this anxiety about the drug market that forced others to call for stricter prescription controls. So you might say that pain was emerging as a topic, but it was a complicated topic around which there was much confusion and political controversy. So by 1963, the US Senate is holding hearings on Percodan prescription. If pain emerges in the 50s as a topic that physicians don't know quite what to do with, and disability judges don't know quite what to do with, by the 1960s, it takes a decidedly more liberal turn with the work of Ronald Melzack, a, a, a Canadian psychologist, a critic of the central role of surgery, which played a dominant role in pain medicine at the time, psychiatry and pharmacy. And the theory that you might say led to the transformation of pain theory to pain medicine is called the gate control theory. He says later on, it wrote in on the zeitgeist. It was astonished by the degree to which it was accepted it endorsed a kind of liberalization of pain. That is, rather than wondering whether the pain is legitimate or not, recognize the fact that pain is necessarily subjective and treat each individual in a way that is suited to their needs. Some might benefit from relaxants, others from tranquilizers, others from sedatives, others from suggestions or placebo, others from hypnosis. All of these deserve attention. You might say the rise of pain theory fit in with the liberal trends of the 1960s. And you see this in Rosie Page's case, which is decided in 1963 by this judge, John Brown. He's a Republican appointed by uh, Eisenhower uh, in an era of sort of moderate republicanism. He's one of the reform-oriented uh, reform Fifth Circuit Four that gets you into another kind of era in political history. But one of the things he says in this case, he validates Rosie Page's pain as legitimate pain. It's a landmark case hinging on the objective, the acceptance of subjective pain as real pain. He writes in his ruling, if pain is real to the patient, the disability entitles the person to the statutory benefits. The fact that pain complained of by the claimant is not shown by objective clinical and laboratory findings does not mean that HEW must give little weight to the allegations thereof. 
With the rise of acceptance of subjective pain as legitimate pain, not just in the courts, but also in the medical realm, we see other indices of how pain is arriving as a legitimate topic of clinical, scientific, and public policy. The 1960s into 1970s sees the emergence of things like patient-controlled analgesia. Instead of wondering about whether the person is in pain or not, put the morphine drip in their hands under cer certain circumstances and allow them to determine the extent of relief. Or in 1975, the creation of the McGill Pain Questionnaire asked the patient, if they're in pain, ask them to describe it and perhaps modify your clinical and therapeutic judgments on the basis of what the patient thinks. Other trends describe a, a, a further liberalization of pain. So when Richard Nixon goes to China in the early 1970s, one of the one of the journalists, James Reston, who accompanies the advanced mission, comes down with a case of appendicitis. He's treated through conventional Western medicine, but he's also treated postoperatively with acupuncture. And in the wake of the opening of the relations of the U.S. to China, the discovery of acupuncture also liberalizes approaches to pain. And as many comment, the theory of gait control legitimated acupuncture, which was once dismissed by Western physicians as a clever trick of auto-suggestion, but here it is being embraced by Americans as another example of the kinds of treatments that should be endorsed in the 1970s. It's in this context that the physician that I follow, James, uh, John Bonica, is regarded as the father of pain medicine, but even he, when asked by US News and World Report in 1974, what is pain? Can science actually define the sensation, he says, if you ask a hundred different authorities that question, you would get a hundred different answers. Because subjective pain requires a multiplicity of responses, and you might say this is the, this is the, this is the culmination of a kind of a liberalization and a liberal moment in American politics and society. As we know, if we know anything about the history of politics, politics often goes in cycles, and the 1980s sees the emergence of more conservative trends in politics, and one of the points of my book is to show how that translates into ju judicial decision-making and clinical decision-making. As one observer wrote from 1984, over the last 20 years, with the emergence of and the building of a disability system, a disability rights movement, uh, the recognition that chronic pain was legitimate, over the last 20 years, a number of federal cases were decided in which the alleged disability was wholly or substantially related to pain. And here you see those liberal trends running up against new political trends in American society. You might say if the 1960s and 70s was seen as an era of expanding relief in the name of compassion, social justice, recognizing individuality and subjectivity and intersubjective understanding, I may not know how much pain you are in, but I ought to really validate it and provide compassionate care. You might say the conservative impulses were always there. Concern about the social consequences of indulging subjective pain feeding of addiction, dependency, malingering, are what became known as learned helplessness, and also the cost. Could we afford the economic, could we afford the cost of building a disability system that was so generous and so expansive and so compassionate? And so it's not surprising to me that when I went, did my research and I went into the Reagan archives in Loma Linda, and I looked at the memos that are flying around the Office of Policy Development in 1981, I could come across this memo by one of those who worked in his administration, Peter Ferrara, who was in the early 1980s, maybe tw two months after Reagan came into office, wondering about how do you roll back the size of government? How do you roll back the welfare state? And one of the problems he identified was this. Over the years, the disability benefit provision were significantly over-liberalized as compared with the original concept of paying such benefits only for truly permanent and total disability. The administration proposal would change back the definition of disability so that it would rest solely on medical grounds and would not take into account vague factors such which are so difficult to determine in a consistent manner. 
And it's not surprising that one of the first things that his Secretary for Health and Human Services, was, Richard Tricker, was asked to do was to re-examine those who were granted disability benefits on the basis of pain. Pain that's subjective without any objective, objective correlates. And so you begin to see the way in which pain has always been political and pain becomes a touchstone for the great battles of our time between liberals and conservatives over the degree of commitment a society has to those in need, over whether we can afford to provide the kind of compassionate relief. And you also see how the courts take up this challenge. So just as you might say there's a conservative trend in politics, there's also a conservative trend in the courts in which the new rulings are quite distinct from those of the 1960s. In one case, uh, the Miranda case, the judge rules, pain is not easily diagnosed, but the secretary is not at the mercy of every claimant's subjective assertions of pain when determining eligibility. And even pain specialists themselves, like Stephen Brenna, working in Atlanta, begins to write of a new phenomenon that he calls the learned pain syndrome. Chronic pain, he says, is often a conditioned socioeconomic disease. Majority of patients show pain behavior in excess of biomedical findings. Society, he said, had gone too far in granting monetary compensation for ex escape from work via pain complaints. So you see how pain is a microcosm of the broader debates of the time. And on the basis of these kind of trends in society, from 1981 to 80 to 81, a purging of the disability roles began. It had actually begun under Carter. So not all of this can be laid to the Reagan administration. It began under Carter, uh, but it followed years of appeal and litigation. About, about 500,000 people were removed from the disability roles, many of them claiming pain as their disability. And ironically, where did this end up? It ends up once again in the courts. It's the courts that needed to decide who was in pain, whether the pain was valid, and how much benefit they should derive. The class action case that was waged by uh, Lorraine Pulaski, a Minnesota housewife, became known as the Pulaski v. Heckler case. It resulted in a victory for patients. Um, the courts, not the physicians, deciding how to uh, determine pain, and I won't go into the detail, but you have an era of congressional legislation and legal settlements trying to thread the needle between these liberal commitments of the 60s and 70s and the new conservative trends of the 80s. In more recent times, and I'm wrapping up here to give you a sense, pain has continued to be a fractious issue in American culture, in American politics. You might say we live in what I call in chapter four a divided states of analgesia, with some states arguing that the main problem of pain is fetal pain. Uh, that is the pain of the fetus that is experienced during abortions, and that if we fully appreciate this pain, we will organize legislation and society in response to it. Whose pain matters? And then in Oregon in the 1990s, you have pain relief at the end of life, really mobilizing liberals. Um, the line between pain relief and euthanasia or end of life care, the source of new debates, and where does it end up? It ends up back in court with the Supreme Court ruling on the legitimacy of, of, of Oregon's death with dignity laws. So I hope I've given you just a short illustration uh, far too short, I can't do justice to the entire book here, on why pain, chronic pain, and pain of multiple varieties has been a source of concern and enduring controversy, and why there's a need for reform, not just at the level of clinical care, but also at the level of politics, and at the level of the education of judges, the education of, of politicians. And I would say one last thing, which is that in some ways, the ideological valence of these issues has done a disservice to people in actual pain. Uh, in the 1990s, we debated pain at two ends of the life course, pain before life began and pain at the end of life. And who was left out of those debates? People living in pain, in chronic pain. So the debate, the reason why this is controversial is that pain measurement is difficult. Pain co crosses boundaries between the science and the political realm and has done so for decades. And how we care for people, you might say, is shaped, is often drawn into these ideological battles of our time. 
So just like we argue about the need for bipartisanship in government, I would say that this is also a topic that needs a certain kind of bipartisanship. People in pain uh, throughout this history have been caught amidst the, the battles of this time period. And I'll end by quoting from the IOM report, and there have been many other IOM reports on this topic calling for report form. And what my book hopes to do is introduce at least a way of thinking about this problem that tries to bridge this ideological divide. Um, I fall in line with what the IOM calls for, which is a need for cultural transformation in the way pain is viewed and treated. And I'm hopeful that my book provides just such an opportunity for thinking broadly about what the true challenges of pain and pain medicine are. Thank you very much.